and we bring you greetings from Reformata family of ministers and churches, this modest group that gathered together this weekend that planned this event a number of months ago uh, to be hosted by Pastor Jim Crabb and the Margo Day Christian Fellowship. It's our joy to be together tonight and have two special guests to debate a theme and a topic that has some controversy in the church today. Uh, I'm Richard Hanner. I pastor the Life of Christ the Redeemer in LaGrange, Georgia, and serve Reformata Family of Ministers. Pastor Jim Crabb is going to come and open us in prayer, but we would like to say, just make some comments about what's going to happen this evening. Uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Gary DeMar, Dr. Michael Brown, coming and representing two perspectives, and they're going to do a conversational, interactive debate. This will be not, this will not be the typical formal debate. We're going to open up in just a few moments and allow each one of them to have 15 to 20 minutes to share their position, to share why they believe that this position is important, what they perceive to be the other positions, challenges in the church, and why. And then, after each one takes approximately 15 to 20 minutes of time to share on their perspectives and their views, uh, then they're going to just simply begin to dialogue and interact and challenge each other on the issues at hand. Our objective is for education and edification of the church so that we might know what the real issues are that are facing us today relative to the issue of Israel and replacement theology. These are two great scholars in the church today. They have great bi biographical background, and so they come qualified to address these issues, each from their own position. And it is our joy to be able to hear them as they interact. Uh, after they start, there will be rarely any comment from our position unless we need to ask a question for clarification or for definition because we're acquainted with the context. The objective is not only to hear them uh, address the issues, but also to educate us. We want to be able to leave having understood what was said and why that was important and, why those, and what those terms meant. So what I would ask these brothers if they would to define their terms. Some of us are unacquainted with the issues and the terminology. So that'll be important so, so that we don't get lost in the process. They're going to help us because this is an educational and an edificational moment for us. These are serious issues and in many cases for some troubling issues. And so it will be our delight to have this debate here tonight. So what I want you to do, first of all, and, and when they begin, they're going to introduce themselves and their ministries and what they represent. We're going to let them do that rather than me doing that. But would you do me the kind favor of telling Dr. Brown and Dr. DeMar, we're really thrilled to have them here at the We enjoyed table fellowship for an hour or so just a few moments ago. These are two brothers in Christ holding different positions on some topics and who have agreements on many things as well. So, Pastor Jim, would you come submit this time to the Lord Jesus and let's believe him to give us hearing ears and listening hearts tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. First, I want to say welcome to everyone. We're honored you're here tonight. I believe God is going to do something really big tonight and really rich in our lives. So enter in and, uh, and receive something from heaven tonight. Amen. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for the church, Lord, the body of Christ. And thank you for training us, equipping us, enlivening us, Lord, and enlarging us. And I thank you, Lord, that this meeting tonight, God, is an answer to prayer from the hearts of the church, Lord, that you would equip us, help us to be changed and grow into your likeness and your image. And we thank you for it all, Lord. Touch us tonight. Make us all like you. And we give you honor and praise in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. 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 A couple of things. Number one, if you have a phone, please silence your phones. I don't, and we would request that you honor what we're doing tonight, not answer your phone. Talk to grandma or uh, whoever and uh, silence your phones at this time. Secondly, if we could hold down all movement, 
as much as we can because it's being videoed and these, these videos will be used in the future to edify the body of Christ. My brothers, over to you. I go first. All right. Uh, it's a delight to be with all of you here. And I'll just give them a second to get the mic set properly. Uh, but it's a delight to be with you. And my prayer before this debate was that God would use my brother and I to help get the truth out and to help bring clarity. Uh, so that's the goal. Uh, the goal is not uh, for me to win or for him to win. The goal is for truth to triumph and for us to increase in our understanding. And we'll do our best over the course of the night to highlight our differences as sharply as we can, but we'll do it as brothers and as colleagues together in the Lord. Uh, when we speak about replacement theology, we're talking about the idea that in some way the church has replaced or displaced Israel in God's plan of salvation. That in some way promises that were given to the ethnic people of Israel no longer apply to them as a nation. That somehow the promises that were once made have been transferred or were always intended for another people so that the modern state of Israel today would not be a fulfillment of prophecy. The idea that there'll be a future national turning of the Jewish people to the Messiah based on passages of scripture would not be held to. And as a Jewish follower of Jesus, this is something I was confronted with early on. One of the biggest obstacles to Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus is church history. That many Jews think of church history and all they know is Crusades, Inquisitions, Holocaust. Yeah. Now I want to make very clear that there are people that hold to replacement theology or supersessionism, the idea that the church has superseded Israel or so-called fulfillment theology, that all the promises uh, to Israel are fulfilled in Jesus and therefore Jews in Jesus receive the promises those on the outside don't. Whatever uh, terms are put on it, there are folks today who hold to replacement theology in one form or another who love the Jewish people, who in no way are anti-Semites. Yeah. I want to say that plainly. Yeah. And you can be critical of modern Israel and not believe that modern Israel is a fulfillment of the prophecy and not be an anti-Semite. Right. I want to say that plainly. That's good. However, in church history, it's indisputable that the teaching of replacement theology opened wide the door to horrific anti-Semitism. And it's a thing that Paul warned against in Romans 11 when he said to the Gentile believers, don't be arrogant and don't boast over the branches. Now, when I came to faith at the age of 16, I was a heroin shooting, LSD using hippie rock drummer. I went to a church to pull my two best friends out and that's how God got hold of me and saved me. I knew as a Jew, we didn't believe in Jesus, but I was not steeped in Judaism and Jewish tradition. So shortly after coming to faith, the local rabbi befriended me, and he gave me a book about anti-Semitism in church history, and it was a shocker. I mean, you can draw a very direct line through the early teaching of replacement theology in the second, third, fourth centuries, right up to Martin Luther's anti-Semitism, and straight from there to the Holocaust. For me, I just kind of discarded church history. After all, we just went back to the Bible. Uh, but you have to wrestle with it. What was happening to the church through the centuries. So this is something that remains of, of critical importance, not just in terms of theoretical issues, but also in terms of how we look at Israel. And if, in fact, the modern state of Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy, should that color our understanding, our thinking? It doesn't mean we sanction everything Israel does. It doesn't mean that the Jews come to faith without Jesus. Dr. DeMar and I emphatically would say everyone needs Jesus to be saved, Jew or Gentile. Thank you. But our understanding of prophecy, our understanding of God's purposes for the end times, that does affect how we live. So let me focus on Israel. And let me explain why it is essential that we recognize that there are promises that God made on the national level to Israel, speaking of identifiable people of a particular ethnic background or general descent, why it's essential that we understand those promises remain. Number one is the faithfulness of God. This has nothing to do with ethnic superiority or favoritism. It has to do with the faithfulness of God. God keeps his promises. Yeah. If the promises that were given to Israel in a categorical way can be transferred to another group or can be broken, then we cannot trust God's promises to the church. 
if God's gracious promises to Israel based on his faithfulness cannot be trusted, if someone could come along later and say they no longer apply, then someone can add a third testament to our Bible and say that, that we are no longer the church, that the church is someone else. Let's think back to Genesis 15. It reflects something very, very important. Covenants were made in the ancient world. One way was that animal uh, sacrifices would be made and the animals divided in two and these bloody carcasses would be separated and then the two kings who'd be making the, the covenant together would walk through the pieces and would say, may God do this to me or may the gods do this to me and to our people. May we become like these carcasses if we violate the terms of this covenant. Well, that's what happens in Genesis 15, except it's striking. Only God passes through the pieces of the covenant. Yeah. Only God passes through the animal sacrifices, meaning this was a one-way promise on God's part. You say, yeah, 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 but the Sinai covenant changed that in their conditions. Remember what Paul wrote in Galatians 3, that the law, which is 430 years after, cannot annul the promise. The unconditional promise came first, yeah. not based on Israel's performance, but based on the faithfulness of God. And what was that promise? That there would be physical land given to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to Psalm 105, 8 through 11. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statue, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. And then we look at explicit promises like this. I'll just give you one example. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. These are categorical. God puts his own reputation on the line in giving these. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the seas that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth will be searched out. Will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. So God is saying, even if they sin, I am still going to keep my covenant. We read in, in the next chapters and the previous chapter, we read that God says, I will scatter you in my anger. I will discipline you, but I will not make a full end of you. I'll fully destroy the nations to which I scatter you, but I not, will not make a full end of you. Who is it that scattered the Jewish people around the world? Who is it that preserved my people in the midst of hellish circumstances? And we have been disciplined and suffered. Who is it who kept us? Who is it who regaled us? The one who said he would do these very yeah. things. This has to do with God's covenant faithfulness. If the church can be sustained by grace, why cannot Israel be sustained by grace? It's also important when it comes to the integrity of God to recognize that there are many prophetic passages that have not yet fully come to pass. For example, the, the prophecies of the return from exile that were given in the, in the books of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah in particular, where God said, despite your sin, because my name is being blasphemed, I'm going to regather you. I'm going to bring you back to the land. Along with that were promises of national revival beyond anything that Israel ever experienced. Beyond that were promises of the whole world being affected by it. They have not yet fully come to pass. Just like there are prophecies of the first and second coming of the Messiah. And there's a transition age between the fullness of those promises coming to pass. The same with the return from exile. Unless God finishes those promises to Israel, he cannot be trusted. His word is not true. And if you spiritually transfer them to another people, you make them void. You make them null and void. Their meaning is now uh, uh, diminished and even ultimately destroyed. There are passages like Zechariah 12 and 14, and I'd love to discuss those in depth, which speak of a future Israel surrounded by the nations of the world, not by a representative sampling of people from different nations, but surrounded by the nations of the world and the people of Israel crying out and God coming in miraculous deliverance. In no way can those passages be applied rightly to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. They speak of a great deliverance. They speak of the manifest rule and reign of God on the earth and the final harvest of the Gentiles. They await fulfillment. 
unless there is a Jewish regathering, unless there is a Jewish Jerusalem, they, they have not yet come to pass, and there are explicit things God promised that haven't happened. What do we make of that? Easy for me to say, we make of it that God keeps his word. We make of it that there is a restoration. We make of it that even now there's world hostility towards Israel and Jerusalem. Why? Because it's prophesied. Because the reputation of God is at stake. I have a very simple syllogism for you. And I, I want to put it forward. When God blesses, no one can curse. When he curses, no one can bless. When God opens a door, no one can shut it. When he shuts a door, no one can open it. When he heals, no one can smite. When he smites, no one can heal. We, we have that laid out often in the Bible. Well, if God scattered the Jewish people in his anger, which I think we would all agree on has happened in past judgment and happened with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 and then again in 135, if, if he did these things in his anger and scattered the Jewish people under a curse, then who can't regather them? We do not have the power to regather ourselves. You can't say the UN did it or politics did it. That would be undoing what God did. The only way that there is a modern restoration and now six million Jews living in the land of Israel, which equals the number that were killed in the Holocaust, the only way that happened is because God regathered. Otherwise, if God scattered and Israel had the power to regather itself, then that would be like God blessing someone and, and, and you, you not have the power to curse them or God cursing someone and they can reverse it and turn it into a blessing. Simple syllogism. Let's, let's go further. This is all explicitly confirmed in the New Testament as well. In the words of Jesus, find me one place when he used the term Israel and was referring to the church. What is one place that's explicit in all of his teaching, what you'll find is Israel, 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 Israel. Well, what he says in Matthew 19, he tells his disciples that in the renewal of all things, which I take to mean the millennial kingdom, God's kingdom on the earth in a future reign, in the renewal of all things, he says to his disciples, you'll be ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. That could have meant nothing to them other than the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's how Paul refers to it. That's how Acts refers to it, 12 tribes of Israel. That's how Jacob James refers to it, Jewish people, Jewish believers in James. Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, there will be an end to the scattering and the trotting underfoot. Matthew 23, 37 to 39, at the end of Jesus denouncing the religious hypocrites, he makes clear that Jerusalem will not see him again until it welcomes him back as Messiah. It says, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A Jewish Jerusalem must welcome him back. Uh, this is confirmed in Acts 1 in a passage often misunderstood. In Acts, the first chapter, after the disciples have spent 40 days with Yeshua after his resurrection, they say to him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he doesn't say, you fools, you idiots, you jerks. I haven't I been with you long enough. Don't you understand the church has displaced Israel? John Calvin sadly said there, there are more errors in that question than there are words. No, Jesus didn't rebuke them. It basically says, good question. It's not for you to know when it's going to, yeah, it's going to happen, but yeah. that's not your focus. Your focus is on the Great Commission. Yeah. And Peter reaffirms this in Acts, the third chapter, where he says that the Messiah, Jesus, must remain in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things comes, promised by the prophets. Read what the prophets said. They do speak of a time when the wolf will lie down with the lamb. They do speak of a time when the teaching of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. And, and, and what does Peter say? Repent that this may happen. Jewish repentance will help usher in the return of the Messiah. And then this is very explicitly confirmed by Paul. So we have Jesus, Peter, and Paul explicitly confirming this in the New Testament. In Romans 9 through 11, you couldn't make it any more clear. First, he begins by saying that the promises remain those of the Israelites, of his own people. And then he says, yes, there's an Israel within Israel. There's the Jewish remnant that has received the promises. But then he uses the word 10 times, Israel, 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 speaking of the nation, the nation who rejected the Messiah, the nation who, who did not uh, pursue God's righteousness, the, the, the nation that God reached his hands out to and they said no. He makes clear they are hardened in part, but not for all time. There remains a remnant that believes, and at the end there'll be a national turning. And, he's, and he says this, that Israel, which is hardened in part, will be saved. All Israel will be saved. And as F.F. Bruce commented, it is impossible 
to entertain an exegesis which takes Israel, in verse 26 here, in a different sense from Israel in verse 25. In other words, blindness happened in part to Israel. Who's that talking about? The nation as a whole. Who will be saved? Israel, the nation as a whole. And then he reiterates it. As far as the gospel is concerned, verse 28, they're enemies. The Jewish people, Israel, the nation that doesn't believe, are enemies. But as far as election, they're loved because of the fathers. God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he keeps his word. That's the God that we serve. He's a covenant-keeping yeah. God. God's dealings with Israel give us confidence that he will keep his promises to the church. We see his faithfulness and his integrity in doing it. Again, F.F. F. Bruce says, temporarily alienated for the advantage of the Gentiles, they are eternally the object of God's electing love because his promises, once made to the patriarchs, will never be revoked. Hence, the new covenant will not be complete until it embraces the people of the old covenant. And what does verse 29 say? For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. When we look at New Testament terminology, uh, the, the, the word Israel is, is used close to 80 times. In no case, in no case, is it explicitly referenced to the church. The couple of verses where it's arguably referenced to the church are easily shown not to refer to that, but either way, it is overwhelmingly, consistently, without exception, used to refer to Israel, the Jewish people, or to the remnant of Jewish people at the least. When it comes to the term Jew or Jews, that, that's used over 185 times in the New Testament. And over and over, you've got Paul saying the gospel is to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. After saying that, that a real Jew is one who's a Jew on the inside, he then repeats the term Jew over and over, speaking about physical people. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? He writes to the Corinthians that to the Jew, the, the gospel is, 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 is a stumbling block. To the, to the Greek, it's foolishness. Over and over, he uses these terms. Yeah. On the words, the lips of Jesus, over and over. Never once is the term Jew explicitly used, or Jews, for the church as a whole. You've got to look at the larger context. It's like we say, you know what a real man is? A real man is someone who cares for his, his wife and kids. A real man is someone who's disciplined in his private life. And then I said, let me talk to you men. I, I use the term one way, but now I'm speaking to everyone. That's how Jew Israel is used throughout the New Testament. The church is not the new Jacob any more than it is the new Israel. That's what Charles Spurgeon said. I think we do not attach sufficient importance to the restoration of the Jews. Remember, Charles Spurgeon was not a dispensational premillennialist. He didn't believe in, a, in an any moment rapture. He didn't hold to a lot of the things dispensationalists hold to, things I once held to when I was a brand new believer that I haven't for many, many years. Spurgeon was not a dispensationalist, for those familiar with that term. I think we do not attach sufficient importance to the restoration of the Jews. We do not think enough about it. But certainly, if there is anything promised in the Bible, it is this. I imagine that you cannot read the Bible without seeing clearly that there is to be an actual restoration of the children of Israel. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great preachers of the last century, said this. It is remarkable that, although they, the Jews, were without their country for so many centuries, and nations did their utmost to destroy them completely, this nation has been preserved. The only real explanation of this is that God has not finished with them and that there is a day coming when this fullness of Israel is going to be brought back to salvation. And so God's ultimate promise is going to receive a wonderful fulfillment. Friends, the devil understands this. That's why anti-Semitism in all of its ugly forms has existed through the centuries. Again, Dr. Damar and I will uh, disagree on certain points. In no way, no way, shape, size, or form am I using the term or concept anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic for things he's saying. I want to be totally clear on that from the outset. But please hear me. The only rational explanation to the phenomenon of anti-Semitism through history, study it out and you'll see, the only rational explanation is the devil is behind it. And he wants to destroy the Jewish people to make God into a liar because God has said they will persevere until the end. He will keep them and they must receive the Messiah back when he returns. Therefore, the devil wants to destroy them. He wants to keep them out of Jerusalem. He wants to keep them out of Jewish control of Jerusalem. He wants to keep them away from Jesus, the Messiah. Satan understands this. I'd say it behooves us to understand this. And you can be pre-mill, all-mill, post-mill. We can discuss that. There are virtues in different positions. The key thing is we must recognize that the promises to Israel remain. 
that there are distinct people on the earth that God has still kept despite our sin and failing and shortcoming right to this moment because of his faithfulness, not ours, and that there is even truth that remains to him blessing those who bless Israel. Let us recognize what God has done in preserving the Jewish people, bringing them back to the land, and, and continuing to work out his final purposes on the earth, whether we have 10 years or 500, God knows. Let us recognize that. Let's recognize what the devil is doing. Therefore, stand with God, stand against the devil, and from my perspective, stand with the word, and then we join hands, arm in arm together to preach the gospel to everyone, to make Jesus known to Jew and Gentile alike. And then in Jesus, we are exact equals. There's no higher, lower, there's no caste system, there's no class system, there's no better, worse. We are one in the Messiah. And together as one new man, let us provoke Israel to jealousy. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. I'm waiting for the clock to reset. Thank you. Seven more seconds. Come on. There we go. What? Back. You ready? There's a lot I can agree with uh, Dr. Brown on. I think, as you'll see when my presentation, part of the disagreement has to come with definitions of things and also when these particular things take place and in what way they take place. Yeah. Let's take this idea of the church. Uh, and all, and almost every time I read somebody, something, everybody talks about the church in Israel. Uh, somehow the church is a new entity in the New Testament. The church is nothing new in the New Testament. The church didn't come to exist after supposedly the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and now God is going to go with the church. That is part and parcel of dispensationalism. We now live in the church age. God dealt with Israel up to a particular point. The prophetic clock stopped. It will start back up again when Jesus returns to rapture his church, and then God will deal with Israel again. We now live in the church age. Now, that's a dispensational view, but that's oftentimes the way the word church is used, as some sort of new entity in the New Testament. It is not. Let me give you my, my reasoning on this. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my ecclesia. Let's start stop using the word church for a moment, and let's look at the word itself, ecclesia. William Tyndale, when he translated the New Testament into English, he translated ecclesia as congregation or assembly. In fact, it was such a thorn in the side of the Roman Catholic Church that they put him to death. That was one of the reasons, because he refused to translate ecclesia as church. The King James Bible, the third requirement for the translators was is that the ecclesiastical words, one of them being ecclesia, had to be translated as church rather than assembly or a congregation. Now, Think about it. The Israel, the, the, the assembly replaces Israel. I, I just took the sting out of that. It doesn't make any sense to say the assembly or the congregation replaced Israel. The reason you can't make that association anymore is because ecclesia is something that was very common to the New Testament writers, the, 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 the disciples themselves. Matthew 16 again. Upon this rock I will build my ecclesia. Matthew chapter 18, tell it to the ecclesia. Why didn't the disciples say, Jesus, what's this ecclesia thing? And the reason is because they understood what it was. When the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into, into uh, Greek, the Hebrew word kahal was translated as ecclesia. If you pick up a Hebrew Bible today, on the, on, the Greek, on, the, on the Greek translation, or Hebrew translation of the Greek in the, in the New Testament, you will see that ecclesia is translated as call. All of those meaning congregation or assembly. And so the disciples didn't see the ecclesia as anything new at all. It was just an extension, a continuation of the ecclesia in the Old Testament. Kahal had been translated ecclesia 80 times in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament what is called the Septuagint. That's extremely important. So the who were, in fact, the first members of the New Testament ecclesia? Israelites, almost exclusively Israelites. Look at the Great Commission. 
Great Commission was, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. To whom is that command given? It's given to Israel. Jewish believers in Jesus. They're the ones that are supposed to take the gospel, what was promised in the Old Testament to Abraham. It's not just to the, to the Jews, not just to physical descendants of Abraham. It's to the nations. And that's another word we need to deal with as well. Let's stop using the word Gentiles and let's get back to the literal translation of, of ethnos and it's nations. So you have the nation of Israel and you have the nations. And as we'll see, we'll see that the nations now become incorporated into this almost exclusively Jewish Israelite ecclesia in the New Testament. So the first members of the ecclesia were Jews and were Israelites. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. The Jews living in Jerusalem from what? From every nation under heaven. Now, obviously, that's hyperbole, but in essence, the Roman, the Roman Empire, the oikomene, another, another Greek word that we need to know, which is a description of the Roman Empire, uh, a, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world be taxed. It's not the word cosmos, it's the word oikomene, which is, it means uh, basically the Roman Empire or the, the, the political entity of, of the day. So, what happens in the in, in the New Testament? You get to the book of you get to the book of Acts. To whom is Peter speaking? Verse fourteen, chapter two: Men of Judea, Jerusalem. Verse twenty-two: Men of Israel. Uh, verse thirty-six: Let Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 39, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord your God shall call to himself. Verse 41, how many were added that day? 3,000 3, souls. Uh, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number Day by day, those who were being saved. Who were the ones being saved? They were Jews. It was Israel that was being saved. Um, chapter 3, verse 18. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, uh, that his Christ should suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and return, that your sins may be wiped away. Verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things. It's interesting. What we have today is that all of these promises made to Israel, which I agree with, with Dr. Brown on, that these are promises and God is going to fulfill those promises. I maintain that God did in fact fulfill those promises to Israel. There's nothing in here that gives any indication that he's not, that he hasn't. What does, what does it say of Elijah? Elijah will come and he will do what? Restore all things. The modern system that is so popular today puts a gap here are all these promises, and you're seeing Jews coming to Jesus Christ by the thousand, which makes up the, the New Testament ecclesia, which is just simply an extension of the Old Testament kahal ecclesia. And what, what we find today is saying, that, yeah, yeah, all those promises that are made to Israel, they're all postponed. We're, not, we're going to see this take place in the distant future. And I maintain that these things, these were being fulfilled within the New Testament era itself. Look at verse 24 of chapter 3. And likewise, all the prophets who have, who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers. Saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. This is, an, this is addressing Israel. Yeah. The, 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 the nations are not in the picture yet. They're not, they don't come on the scene till, 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 much, till much later. Chapter 4, verse 4. 5,000 are added. Now you get to chapter 5. Verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole ecclesia and upon all who heard of these things. The church. Well, who is this church? They consist of Jews, Israelites. These are, all, these are all Jews. And the promises that were made to 
to Israel are, were being fulfilled in that particular day. Verse, um, verse 17. But the high priest rose up among all, uh, with all of his associates. That is, they were filled with jealousy. That word occurs numerous times in the book of Acts. And it's the same word that's found in Romans chapter 11. Hopefully we'll get to that particular uh, that passage as well tonight. Um, verse 30 of chapter 5. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God um, exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior to grant re repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is, again, addressed to Israel. It's addressed to the ecclesia. Uh, you can go further, chapter, chapter 7. We know... Um, we know the, uh, the, the speech of Stephen, which is going to give you an interesting little side note here. If you look at, at Stephen's speech, Acts chapter 7, verse 38, this is the one who was in the ecclesia in the wilderness together with the angel who was, to, uh, was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. That, that's the Greek word ecclesia. The King James Version actually translates that as church. But that's dealing with Israel. But it's, don't think church, think congregation, assembly of the Lord. That's what the word means. Um, and if you look at chapter 8, after, after, Stephen, after Stephen is stoned to death, if you look at chapter 8, what do you find? And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. Here again, we see the word ecclesia, not as some third entity, not some sort of distinction between Israel and the church. There is no such thing. The church represents the congregation of God's people. The ecclesia represents the congregation of God's people. God makes a promise. It's repeated here in, in Luke. This is why Jesus came to fulfill this promise. And you kind of get the feeling that God failed in his promise. And so what he has to do is put a postponement on the promise. And he won't be fulfilling that promise until some time in the future. Now, I'm going I'm to add something here and that a lot, of, a lot of people really don't know. What is the future for Israel according to this modern system? What is it? Well, we're talking, you know. Here's God's waited 2,000 years, 2,000 years to finally bless Israel again, bring them back into the land again. And what happens to them when they're in the land? Two-thirds of them are slaughtered. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. I've got these quotations here uh, that are rather remarkable. Um, uh, Sid Roth um, Host of Messianic vision, vision stated that two thirds of the Jewish, uh, Jewish people living in Israel will be exterminated to, during the future Great Tribulation. He bases his view on Zechariah 13:8. Pat Robertson said to Roth, "You don't foresee some kind of persecution against the Jews in America, do you?" Roth responded, "Unfortunately, I believe God foresees this. Roth believes that the end is near. Roth believes that the Jews are destined to suffer based on a futurized interpretation of Zechariah 13:8 through 9." K. Arthur. I'm not going to read all of these, but I have them all here. They're, they're in one of my books. I can't remember which one it is. Jack Van Empe. Israel's final holocaust, in which he writes that when the prophecy clock starts ticking again after the rapture, it will be traumatic. I'm quoting now. It will be traumatic days for Israel. Just when peace seems to have come, it will be taken from her, and she will be plunged into another bloody persecution, a devastating explosion of persecution and misery for Israel. Here's, I won't read this quotation, but it's from the same publisher that actually published uh, Dr. Brown's book, Blow the, it's called Blow the Trumpet in, in Zion. And uh, what is this terrible tribulation that awaits the Jews? Moses said it would take place in the latter days. It is the last seven years of this age, just prior to the coming of Messiah, Jesus, to earth. The Bible says this will be a time of suffering such as the world has never known. The Antichrist will kill two-thirds of the Jews. This could mean that up to 10 million Jews could be killed. Now, the question I would have is, 
which position really puts the Jews in jeopardy. Now, during World War II, and I would suggest you get a book by, by um, Dwight Wilson called Armageddon Now, where he goes back and looks at writers who hold to this end time perspective and basically say what was happened, happening to the Jew, Jews was part of this future holocaust that supposedly was going to be poured out on, the, on, on, on Israel while they're back in their land. Here's Charles Ryrie who writes in his book, The Best is Yet to Come. It's an ironic title given what he says, says next, that Israel will undergo the worst bloodbath in Jew Jewish history. I'm quoting. Um, Israel is destined to have a particular time of suffering which will eclipse anything that it has known in the past. The people of Israel are placing themselves within the vortex of this future whirlwind which will destroy the majority of those living in the land of Palestine. I've got more of these. You see, this particular position which postpones these promises, I believe puts Israel in jeopardy throughout our modern history because there are so many people who actually believe that tribulation is coming to Israel. I, I debated Paige, Paige Patterson a few years ago. And uh, again, he's somebody who holds this end time perspective. He told me, Israel has to be kicked out of the land again. Because they have to be brought back believing. Uh, and you have, have others, uh, others, mostly older dispensationalists, who maintain that Israel today has no prophetic significance whatsoever. Because according to that particular position, we're now living in the supposed church age. God isn't dealing with Israel now. He's only dealing with this thing called the church. And God won't deal with Israel again until the rapture takes place. Now, I, Dr. Brown doesn't, he's not a pre-tribulational rapturist. He doesn't believe that. But this particular position has a whole lot more followers than I have. And my, I have the book sales to prove it. <laughs> So let's, let's get back to the, the basics of this again. The church is not a new thing in the New Testament. It has always been there. Part of the problem is, is that we've created a word called the church when we should have just followed Tyndale and said it is a congregation. I have a, a, a new tra uh, translation put out by, by Messianic Jews, um, and I looked to see how they translated uh, Matthew 16, in Matthew 18, and sure enough, they translate it as congregation, assembly. It changes the whole dynamic when you do that. Everything changes. This whole Israel church distinction goes away. And we, we learn later on, it's interesting, do you think of where Peter was when he gets the message that he's supposed to take the gospel to the nations? Where was he? He was in Joppa. Who else was in Joppa? Jonah. Jonah was in Joppa. Remember, Peter was very reluctant to take the gospel to the Gentiles. What is, what is Peter's full name? Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. This is a different Jonah now because he obeys God, meets with Cornelius, sees the, 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 the animals coming down. And he says, God tells him, take, kill, and eat. Peter says, I've never eaten any unclean, any unclean thing. Don't call these unclean anymore. Because now the nations, just as Abraham promised, are going to be grafted in to this already existing Jewish church. E ecclesia. So there isn't this distinction between Israel and the church. There isn't this idea that the promises are now for the church. Of course, you can say that. You could say that because at least up and through chapter 9, the, the promises were for the church, made up exclusively of, for, for Israel. The Gentiles then were grafted into an already existing Jewish ecclesia, which means, it seems to me, that once they're in there, how do you now divide them out and say, okay, now these blessings are going to be for, for, for the Jews and this, these blessings are going to be for the nation. You can't do that. Because there's, in Christ, there's no longer any Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male or female. It doesn't mean there aren't any Jews anymore. It doesn't mean 
there aren't any women and men anymore. It's just that in Christ, we are inheritors. If you read the promises made by uh, in, in Paul, we inherit. We're fellow heirs with Christ. Yeah. Anyway, that that's puts this in my perspective. I believe the promises made to Israel have, back, have in fact been fulfilled, just like God said they would be. Does that mean that there were that Jews in the future won't be saved? Not at all. Meganoita, may it never be. There, throughout history, as, as Dr. Brown and I agree, you can't, you can't enjoy the blessings of Jesus Christ unless you are in Christ. Yes. And that, took, that, that was true of what took place in the, in, in the early church, and it's true today. And I'm sure from now we'll have some interesting dialogue. <laughs> So let, let me maybe ask a question for clarification okay. as we begin to go back and forth. First, uh, in my book, Revolution in the Church, I cite that very same third rule of the translators of the King James to translate the ecclesiastical terminology and to erroneously translate with church. So I'm all for you. Uh, all of you are not translated with congregation. Uh, and no question that uh, saved Jews and saved people of the nations make up the ecclesia and that we're one of the Messiah. But what's not clear to me is, is how you address the specific promises to Israel. For example, that God would preserve not the ecclesia, but these descendants, these physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he promised them a land, how that has been fulfilled. And to fine tune the question, when, when Peter says all the prophets spoke in these days, remember Jesus just taught him that in Luke 24 about what he suffered, that he's gonna suffer and die. There are other promises that it, either you believe were realized in AD 70, or I say are still to be realized in the future. In other words, the things had to do with the suffering, death, atonement for sin, that was all fulfilled. The prophet spoke about his suffering that was to come. But the idea that there would be no ongoing long-term fulfillment, that's, that's nowhere countenanced. Uh, I'm not dispensationalist, I don't believe in the postponement issues, as, as you know. So I feel a lot of what you presented was arguing against the position I don't hold, as, as you acknowledged. But again, to be clear, one, what happens to those physical promises, and I could read one after another after another that in no fair interpretation have already been fulfilled. What happens to those to a specific people, not to the nations, but to Israel? And, and then, do you see no nuance in the term fulfilled? Is, is there no way that there can be a fulfillment that takes time, an ongoing fulfillment over history? But just one question. Well, it's, it's, it's two parts. It's two parts. I'm going to do it. We'll fine tune this. Yeah. Um, let me kind of set this up a little bit. I'm going to try to do this quickly because we want to make sure we, we, get, we get to do our, our, our thing here. Uh, it's interesting how many times prophecies are made in the Old, Old Testament or, or symbols, symbols, symbols and so forth are the way they're fulfilled. I mentioned, I mentioned Elijah. Uh, New Testament says... John the Baptist is Elijah, but he's not Elijah. He's John the Baptist. Elijah's dead, but the Bible says he's Elijah. It says of Jesus, destroy this temple, speaking about his body, and in three days I will raise it back up again. It's taken, look how many years it's taken to this temple. You're missing the point. That was, a, that was something that was uh, a prelude to something greater. You know, some, somebody greater, something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus said. Yeah. We're talking about something much bigger. That stone, that, that stone temple meant nothing. What meant, what meant something were living stones. And we, we, we read in the New Testament how many times our, our, our believers in Christ call the temple of God. Jesus, in, in John chapter 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. In the, verse 14, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus is now the tabernacle. Uh, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Um, you, can, you, can go on, you can go on with all these things. What we find, I think, within the New Testament is a new categorization of those promises. Jesus, all of those things are being fulfilled. I think it's one of the reasons why Jesus was, was, uh, was crucified, because he would not fit their scheme of things. Now we go to the book of Hebrews about Lamb. Because uh, that, that, that always comes up. And I, that's a very good question. I don't, sure, sure. Thing, though, sure. Before we get to specific land, 
uh, it was literally prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. He was, not spiritual Bethlehem, but literal. Uh, it was prophesied to be born in the maid, the virgin. Uh, he, he literally was. It was prophesied that he would die, that he would rise. He literally was. The exception to the rule is a metaphorical application. The, the constant is the literal fulfillment. If he did not literally die, if he did not literally rise, if he was not literally born a certain way to a certain place at a certain time, the prophets would have been emptied of their meaning. So I, I find it in that sense disingenuous to not look at the larger promises because otherwise what you end up with is God scatters Israel in his anger, literal, but he regathers them spiritually. It, 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 then, oh no, the judgment, the bad stuff literally happens, but all the good stuff only spiritually happens, and it's just kind of pick and choose well, them. Okay, yeah. I, I, think, I think using the word literal is one of those kind of slippery words as well. Um, well, I, I'll give you a good example of this. First Peter, First Peter, um, Since First Peter, First uh, First Peter chapter two verse four, and coming to him as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. That's literal, but it's not physical. But it was understood. I the building was rejected. Okay, right. right. From the start, the verse five. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. For a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I, look, I, I, when I when I go to study Scripture, I'm looking for the so-called literal interpretation. But there's just so many times in the New Testament where it seems like those types of things are are, are turned on their head by Jesus, and he, he he maintains that there is something about this old the Old Testament about the land about the temple, about the sacrifices, because Jesus is in fact the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, even though he, he, and he literally or physically died on the cross. But he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The death of Jesus takes place during the time where the Paschal Lamb would have been, would have been, sl would have been slain. So, here, go ahead. Can you do it within the same verse? In, in other words, we agree there are metaphorical applications, and it's figures of speech. We all use that to this day. Um, when Jesus said that Jerusalem would be destroyed, it was destroyed. When he spoke of scattering, they were scattering. So when you have it in the same verse of the prophets, you will be scattered. You'll be regathered. You can't split that. You can't make the scattering literal and the regathering spiritual. It, because it, 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 when Jesus said, destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days, talking about his, his physical body right. on both sides of the verse. So. I can show you verse after verse after verse where the judgment part did happen to Israel and the restoration part still has not happened. If you make that spiritual metaphorical, then the whole thing becomes meaningless. Again, someone could then write a third testament where they now put a new meaning on, on, on what, what the New Testament says. And that, that to me is highly problematic. And that's what the churches often did, done through history. That the bad stuff goes to Israel, the curses, and the blessings that's for us. God says, I will scatter you in my wrath. That's the Jews. And I will be gathered in my love. That's us, the Christians. But no, no. <laughs> no. Well, you, you said the right word. Christians. The, the Jews were, in fact, gathered in his love. And bringing him, that's the point. The same way they were scattered? Well, as we, we'll, read, we'll read further on here that we see in the, in, in the New Testament. That I'm, I'm trying to find a verse here in John, um, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 47. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men who will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should perish, should not perish. Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Again, this literally took place in the first century. 
it isn't something that has to take place in the distant future. This gathering, in fact, if, if in, in, in the book of Acts, where, where, does the, where do these Jews go who are given this, this commission by Jesus? We're, we're given kind of a, a circle here of... Yeah, verse 8, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, well, verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. That's where I believe this, re this gathering is taking place. But, but you, you, want to, you, want to bring them, you want to bring them back, you want to bring them to the physical land of Israel and see that that is the fulfillment of the promise. But as I'll read further on, you will see that the, that the Bible presents that promise use, using the same type of language in a way that finds its fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Right. So, so there are two sides to this. The one side is, yes, there's a spiritual regathering in John 11, speaking of not only Jewish people, but people of the nations around the world. That's all it's been spoken of. Because remember, they were still in the land. Even though there were Jews around the world, they were still in the land. There had not been the scattering, the full scattering from the land yet, the destruction of, of Jerusalem. But you, you cannot you cannot have part one literal, part two spiritual without making God's word gibberish. When Jesus speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem until, then, then that until ha has to now be just as real. So I read a verse like Jeremiah 31.10, and in my commentary on Jeremiah, I had to work through this carefully and see that there, that there was a fulfillment over time, that there were things that were never brought to their fullness when the Jewish people were restored from, from Babylonian exile. In fact, it looks like a complete disappointment compared to what's supposed to happen, so we know it's not yet emptied of its meaning. There is yet more to happen. So Jeremiah uh, chapter, chapter 30, uh, do not fear, verse 10, do not fear Jacob, my servant, do, do not be dismayed, O Israel. The church, the ecclesia, including Gentiles, is never called Jacob, never, not once. Uh, I will surely save you out of a distant place, you descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you. I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. 31.10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and watch over his flock like a shepherd. Look, Paul never should have written Romans 9 through 11 because there is no mystery. He should have said, praise God, all the promises are fulfilled. Instead, he's in agony knowing that the promises that remain, he said, there, theirs are the promises, not were. They haven't yet been fulfilled. And then he says, this is perfect opportunity. Romans 9 through 11, where he spends three whole chapters dealing with this question of what happened to the promises to Israel. He begins by explaining that, that they, have not, uh, they have not fallen short because there's a remnant that believes there's an Israel. Within Israel, Romans 9, 6, the Israel you're pointing to in the book of Acts, the, rem, the, the, the nucleus of the ecclesia. But then he says in Romans the 11th chapter, I'm writing to you nations, people of the nations, Gentiles in most of our translations. Because your role is to provoke Israel to je jealousy and, not, and, and don't be arrogant, don't boast against it. Why is he saying that? Because unfulfilled promises remain. He says, has they stumbled to us before? Not at all. Why? Because unfulfilled promises remain. And then he points to the future fulfillment of them. As he's writing, it has not yet happened. All Israel will be saved. As far as the gospel, they're enemies. The Redeemer will come from Zion. These things will happen. They have not yet happened on that national level. Okay, we're good. I, I want to get back. I want to get to Romans nine through eleven. I want to get back to the the, the land. Okay, land. sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> but but again, my, my, my simple thing I don't think has been answered yet. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. Which is, <laughs> if he literally scattered us from the land and literally said he would regather us and do X Y Z when we're back in the land, if that has not literally happened, then how can it be true? If there's a spiritual fulfillment or a fulfillment that applies to the Gentiles. How can it literally be God said, I will do this, and I will do that. I will smite you, and I will heal you. Okay, so he smites the Jews, and he heals the Christians. How does that work? Well, well, we'll go on with this. Okay. okay. All right. In Hebrews chapter 11, talking about Abraham, by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise and in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. 
for he was looking for the city which was foundate, whose foundation, whose foundations, whose architect and builder is is uh, is God. Verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Then you get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that may be touched into a blazing fire, into darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was uh, that uh, who heard begged that no further should be, uh, words should be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion. Okay? But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and ecclesia of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, which the book of Hebrews doesn't call it, just doesn't call it a new covenant, but he calls it a better covenant. This is better. And to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the land, earth, then, and now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken. The, in, in my estimation, what's being shaken here is all of those, the Old Testament rites and rituals and the animal sacrifices and the human priesthood, where the priesthood, uh, where the priesthood had to uh, offer sacrifices for, for themselves. Jesus is now the, the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And by the way, he's not from the, from the tribe of Levi, not from the tribe of Judah. And the law, Hebrews says the law was changed in order to make that, make that possible. And this expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we we'll receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, this is, this is when, I, when I read all of this, it's, it just seems to me that what's being, what's being done here, especially in the book of Hebrews, constantly talks about um, a better covenant, covenant. Verse 13, chapter 8. The new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. But, 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 so, but whatever so. is becoming obsolete and growing old is near to disappear. Right, right. So we agree. Sinai covenant. We're not, we're not arguing Sinai covenant. In other words, the whole priesthood issue of Sinai covenant is done. Remember, new covenant. There was no such thing as the Old Testament in Jesus' day. Right. Right. So, so you had the Bible. Okay. Uh, and and the, the Bible is what we're dealing with. The New Covenant, where does that come from? Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. In fact, the citation in Hebrews 8 cites all those verses. It's the longest single citation from anywhere uh, in the entire uh, Hebrew Scriptures, anywhere in the New Testament. It's the citation of the New Covenant that God's going to make. So this is Jeremiah. What you have to do is realize that Hebrews is not saying throw out all the words of the prophets. And we now distort and destroy all the words of the prophets. The Hebrews is not saying we understand this better than the prophets do. So Hebrews is making spiritual application, which I affirm every inch of. Let, let me ask you a question about the Romans 8, the, where, where the writer of the Hebrews says, he starts quoting right. Jeremiah. Right. For, the, uh, for if that first covenant had been faultless. Sinai covenant, right? So at the Sinai covenant. Well, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just putting right. this context here. Uh, there would have been no occasion sought for a second for, for finding fault with them, he says. And then he quotes the, the material from Jeremiah. Exactly. When was the material from was the material from Jeremiah fulfilled when the writer of the Hebrews wrote, or are you saying this is something yet for the distant future? No, the beginning of the fulfillment of the new covenant 
uh, is, is with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're living in that reality, but it's a transition. And all those Jews who were brought into this new covenant, yes. you would agree, everything what I said in, in, in the book of Acts, this was a... This was an exclusively Israelite ecclesia yes, to which the Gentiles were grafted in. Yes, sir. Is there any indication there that there is a promise mentioned in the New Testament that Israel will return to the land as a, as a necessary fulfillment of some Bible prophecy? Well, number one, they weren't all scattered from the land, so it was not the kind of question that would be well, asked. Why, why didn't they? Because why that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I can give you many things that the Hebrew Scriptures speak that the New Testament does not reiterate in every single one. But if uh, Matthew 19 is going to be fulfilled, uh, which is that, that the 12 disciples will sit ruling over the, the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, that would require some kind of regathering. Luke 21, which I cited, is going to require some kind of regathering if... if uh, Jerusalem is destroyed until uh, Matthew 23, 37 to 39 requires a Jewish Jerusalem welcoming back the Messiah. So, so yes, it's, it's presupposed in those passages. Acts 3, 19 and following that I cited, speaking of all that the prophets said being fulfilled. We'll go back and look at what they said. So let's analyze this idea that Abraham and his descendants didn't care about the land. No, no, I, of I, course I, they... I, I, I want to ask you, I, before you go, because I'm going to lose track of my, my point here. Okay. Second. Okay. Great Commission. Uh, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Uh, go make disciples, uh, teaching them everything I've observed, and so forth. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the command in Acts, Acts chapter 1, you're supposed to begin in Jerusalem and go out to the remotest parts of the earth. Right. Uh, to me, the, 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 the Jews would have seen this as the, fulfill, the, the, the extension of the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. All those promises and so forth were being fulfilled in the Messiah has come and believe in him and so forth. And we know that, that uh, Paul talks about that the gospel had been preached to in all creation under heaven to the point where Paul says in Romans 16 that even th that all the nations have in fact received the, the, the gospel in that particular time. Those nations, those in the diaspora that Peter talks about and James talks about, they're scattered among the nations. And now the gospel is going to those to those Jews in, in the nations. Well, why are we still preaching if it's already been fulfilled? What? Why are we still going to the ends of the earth? Why are we what? still agonizing and weeping all over the lost if it's already all done? No, I'm saying for that particular generation, this is this is this because this will take us to Romans chapter nine. Paul says, I'm just I'm just quoting what Paul says that the gospel has in fact been preached to all creation under yeah. heaven. That's what he says. That's, that's what the verse says. Um, but I, and you I, think he felt that they were done? No, I did not feel. Oh, okay. okay, so you, you don't mean it the way you're saying. I'm, I'm saying. <laughs> I mean it the way I'm saying it, based upon the context in which it's being said. All right. Okay. The, the, so it depends on what the definition the, is. It. No, I'm, it's I'm, not I'm, just I'm, just having, I'm just having fun. The, Jesus made it very clear in the Olivet discourse that the, this, these, these things were going to come about before that particular generation passed away. It doesn't mean that the Jews aren't going to be brought back in, uh, that they're, never, they're, not part of the, they're not part of the covenant promises and so forth, and God doesn't want to have to do with, with, uh, with the Jews anymore. This was a covenantal transition between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant with the destruction of the temple and everything related to it. That Old Covenant passes away. Jesus is now the focus of history. So my point is, is that if giving your perspective about the land and so forth and all these promises, when all of these Jewish evangelists go out into the, 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 the oikumene, the nations, and preach the gospel to all, all creation under heaven, why didn't they say part of the promise that we have is the land? Why, don't, why, aren't, we, why aren't we coming back to the land? Let, this gathering, this would have been a perfect opportunity for all of these Jewish evangelists, Paul and, and, and Peter and the rest of them, to say, these promises have to be fulfilled. Very, Let's return to the land. Very easy. Number one, they were not yet nationally scattered. Okay? They, they, were, still, they, they were still nationally scattered. They were still based. They, they, Jerusalem was still their capital. They were still based. They, they had their uh, large numbers of, of Jews living there in the land, so they were not yet fully scattered, Jerusalem had not yet been destroyed, that's number one. Number two, the only Bible I have was the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew Scriptures, which says it over and over and over that's and over again. That's my point. Number three, there's not a single instance recorded where everybody, anybody ever questioned it. 
It, it, it's, it's like saying, saying, how come Jesus didn't, how come Jesus never renounced Martians? It was just not an but here's issue. the point. But if, if in fact, those pro the land promises were part and parcel to the, to the covenant promises, and the, uh, the inside... But that was not, the, the, their business was to go and make Jesus known to the nations. That was the commission. But, not to argue about something that was not being but argued today, about. But today, but today, when uh, we talk, we hear about, well, we, we, the Jews need to return, return to the land. It's part of, it's, got, it's part of God's covenant of promise. And the Jews need to return to the land. And we say, yes, because that's the covenant of promise. Well, according to your position, that covenantal promise was still in existence. And the thing is, why then didn't they say, look, this is the perfect opportunity for us to return to the land. There's no hindrance. There were Jews living in Jerusalem from every nation under, under heaven. The Romans weren't going to stop it from coming, possibly. Why not come to the land? They didn't. Why didn't they? Because the ex expansion of the kingdom was much bigger than what they expected. It's not just the land of Israel. Abraham is told in Romans chapter 4, 4 3, that he is the heir of the world. Right. This is much bigger than that. But the, the bigness does not exclude the specific place that Jews need a place to live. Look, the land is completely secondary to me. The issue is the faithfulness of God in keeping his promises to Israel. So when is, when is, and, and I never said Jews need to return. God, God is doing the regathering. I don't go around the world saying you need to come back to the land. And Jews at that time, their messianic expectation would have been that God would supernaturally do the regathering. But, but let me, let me I just when, God, when God brought back the Jews from the, the captivity, Okay, uh, Israel Israel goes off into captivity under the Assyrians, and then the two southern tribes that go under the, under the captivity of the Babylonians. Uh, we read in Ezra and Nehemiah that they're they're back, they're back in the land. What was the what was the disposition of those Jews when they came back? They were repentant. In fact, there's one particular place I think it's in in, in Ezra where the people are so penitent, so remorseful of their sins that they are instructed to stop. But that's not Israel today. I mean, that is I mean, Israel today, and this, and Israel. We have to remember the time element of all of this was. And I know you're not a dispensationalist, but let, let's face facts here. Uh, the, the the prominent position today is Israel returning to the land in 1948 was prophetically significant, and they were, all hell was supposed to break loose within 40 uh, 40 years. With so by 1988. This was all supposed to have been, right. been taken care of. But again, that's not my position. So, so let me let me go back. But to I this. want to know why they wouldn't have told okay. the Jews to return to the land if the land was so important to them. First thing, there was the, to, to reiterate, with Jerusalem still standing and the nucleus of Jews still living there, that was not the pressing issue. Second thing, that would have their been the main perfect. message was to, uh, in your mind, it would have been the perfect time. But if they believed that with the Gentiles hearing the message that that would bring the culmination of the ages and God would then restore the Jewish people. Look, there are religious Jews to this day that say you do not have a movement to bring Jews back. Only the Messiah will do that. We, we do not know in detail the eschatological, the end time beliefs of, of the Jewish people at the time. There are, there are many different competing views. But it could well be they held to the same thing. Their first thought probably was we don't need to go to the Gentiles because Jewish repentance will bring salvation to the whole world. They got that wrong. Great insight about Joppa, Simon, Son of Jonah. Great insight. I love it. Comparing Acts 10 to Jonah 1. Okay, so what we do know is that many did believe and do believe to this day that once the mission, the Jewish mission, goes through the world, then God will regather the people. So the mission is get the message to the Gentiles and God will take care of the physical regathering. It was not doubted for a split second the importance of returning to the land was universally held in, in the ancient Jewish world. And, and why was it held? It's over and over and over again in the prophets. So let's think. You, you read all of the relevant return from exile prophets, prophecies in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah in particular. It is impossible to say that those happened in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Why are they repenting and weeping? They're intermarrying. After all this, they're intermarrying. They're committing all kinds of sin. By the, by the days of Malachi, second temple, God's saying, shut the temple doors. So you, you are now left with this mystery of all this glorious stuff was supposed to happen on the heels of the physical return to the land. And I'll read lengthy passages if you want. It didn't happen. So what do we see? It is ongoing still. When we get back to Hebrews 11, the idea that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't actually care 
about the physical land. What's the whole promise of the Exodus after that? That Moses, God himself reiterates, oh, God, I will bring you to the land I promised your fathers. I will bring you to the land. They should have said, we don't need this land. We're going to heaven. We don't need this land. We're just talking about a spiritual Zion. The fact well, that wait, they, the, the, the whole point of the land is the same thing with the genealogy. As the promised Messiah comes, he comes to Bethlehem. That's his prophesy. So you certainly needed the land. You needed circumcision. But, but you said that they didn't care. You're saying that the right reading of Hebrews 11 that, is that, that, that land didn't that, matter. I didn't say it didn't care. I'm saying that the the, the promises the promises made are expansive to the land and include the world. It's not. Yeah, but the whole world. But look, the 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 the, the Jewish Abraham apostles called, knew the promises that when Israel is blessed in the land, that the whole world will see salvation. And they knew, you know, they didn't get it right in terms of their time frame, that Israel was to be a light to the world, a light to the nations. Exactly. So the, right. right. So, so Deuteronomy the, 4, Deuteronomy 4, Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. And you find in, in Luke, the same promise is given. And then you find in Matthew chapter 28 that the, the, these, these Jewish believers are to take the gospel to the world as a light to the exactly. nations, a promise promise fulfilled. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, uh, you insult the earth by the world, first spoken to Jewish right. disciples and then to all disciples by, by, by extension. But here's the problem. If I make you a promise, Gary, I am going to give you a Porsche, and it is yours. I want you to have it. I want you to enjoy it. It's yours, buddy. And I deliver it to your house, and you say, Mike, you kept your word. It's a sure thing. And the next day I take it. I haven't kept my word. It was not that Israel would be in the land for a couple of days. It was that the land was a sign of the faithfulness and the promise of God. Yes, it matters now because Jewish people need a place to live. It does matter because of world persecution and things like that. But historically, the big issue was it was a physical reality, a physical sign of the promises. So when we get to Romans 9, we focus on the spiritual issue, okay? And again, I still say the God who scattered had to regather. And, and perhaps before we get to the Romans passage, explain to me if God scattered the Jewish people in his anger, right? And, and when God curses, no one can bless. When he smites, no one can heal. When he scatters, no one can regather. How is it then that we, re, we manage to regather ourselves and undo the divine scattering and now be six million strong in the midst of a world that wants to destroy us? How do we manage to do that if, if God scattered us and God cursed us? Did we unscatter ourselves and uncurse ourselves? We had power to undo the decree well, of God. I read in the passage in John 11, this, the, the, God was the one doing the gathering. He is doing. He was doing the gathering, the gathering in the first century. But let me go back to your but analogy today, about the porch. Today, how did, how did we, who, who did we gather us? If well, God scattered us, if you, how did we manage if, to regather if, ourselves? If you, look at, if you look at the history of it, it seems like the Jews themselves regathered themselves. So we undid the curse. So it's basically well, no, like, because I don't, I don't like I'm a Jew, we can be stubborn. So if we go to hell, we're going to undo that. And I don't, and I don't, that. I don't, again, I don't think those, I don't, there isn't a single place in the New Testament which talks about a prophetic necessity for Israel to be back in the land. But, but, but so, I just want to press this. If God scattered us from judgment, right, then we had the ability to undo the scattering. That would mean that God could smite someone and say, I curse you, and that person can then can turn that around and bless themselves. That God can say, you are lost, I sent you to hell, and they can say, no, I decide to go to heaven, and they can undo the decree My of God. My point is, God did the regathering of his people. He gathered his people into one new people. That's what, that's what Ephesians 2 was all about. It has Where nothing you, to do with the physical scattering, nor does John 11. But let me, let me come back to your, your but, but, analogy. But you the so you're saying God scattered the Jews in his wrath, in judgment, and we undid that by regathering ourselves. Brothers, may I yeah. ask a question for clarification? Yes. When, they, when did they get scattered and why for the congregation? We're assuming that they understand. Yeah. The, so you, you keep asking about, uh, about the scattering. Well, I, when did it scatter? Yeah, before you do that, scattered. I just want to, I'm going to Take your analogy um, and say, okay, I, I promise to give you a Dodge Dart. <laughs> and, then I turn, and then I turn around and give you a porch. See? But do you take God, it back? No, no, my point is, God promises, them the, promises Abraham the land, and he gives them the world. 
That's that's the difference in the position. But if you're but if if they so happen by the way that the only vehicle you have access to is a dart and you don't have it anymore because somebody else is driving the Porsche but, if you got the same bad say, results. Let me say ah. the same bad results. It's no, but I would say this as well. The world does not exclude the nation of Israel. That's that's the point. You get the world. You get you get Israel, and you get the whole you get the whole shooting. But do the, the people that were do the Jewish people get the land of Israel? Because the whole world can't fit there. And if we need a place where we can be safe, or if we need a place where God can demonstrate that He is God, very gathering. Just to answer your question. Uh, the scattering began in the Assyrian exile in, in 721. It continued in the Babylonian exile in 586, and then it has expanded with the exile in AD 70 and AD 135 as we're scattered around the world. Why? Divine judgment. Jesus said in Luke 19, these things will come upon you, Israel, because you don't recognize the time of your visitation. So the scattering has been ongoing through history. Uh, it reached its, its focal point with 135 with Jews banned from Jerusalem. Uh, and we were scattered with only a small presence in the land through history. The vast, vast, vast majority, 90 plus percent, 99 percent of us scattered around the world. And then the beginning of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, a gradual regathering has been done. Just like Ezekiel 36 said, not because your works. Look, Tel Aviv is the world's most gay-friendly city, overwhelmingly. They just had a gay pride event yeah. with 180,000 people. If you compute that in American terms, it would be the biggest gay pride event in world history. Uh, and only 30,000 were from the outside. Yep, there it is there, it, exactly. In, the, in fact, it is the number one destination for homosexuals in the world. Not San Francisco, not Atlanta, not New York, it's Tel Aviv. When, when a survey was done a few years ago, and, and they, they surveyed among gay readers uh, which was the most gay-friendly city in the world, the city that came in number two got about 14% of the vote. The city that came in number one, Tel Aviv, got 43% of the vote. The ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, that would oppose this to the death if, if they could, uh, they militantly opposed the gospel. Uh, even though Israel stands out in many ways as a democracy in the Middle East and is our best ally, in point of fact, Israel exists only by God's grace, not because of works. But, but I still come back to the fact that regardless of all the spiritual regathering interpretation you put, and look, you're, you're a, a sharp man, a student of the word like me, you've thought these things through in depth. I'm not trying to sound like you, honestly. But I've asked this for years now and not gotten an answer. If we were scattered under divine judgment, which is so clear over and over and over and over, and part of the scattering, uh, the physical scattering was a part of it, then we can't regather ourselves. That would be undoing the scattering. So the only explanation I have is that God, in His grace and mercy, for His name's sake, because His name is blasphemy, has been regathering us back to the land to fulfill His promises. And then there in the land, He says, I'll sprinkle clean water on you. He said, repentance doesn't happen. Under Sinai covenant, we had to repent, right? To get the dog's dart. But under the eternal covenant, God's going to give the Porsche, even though we spat on it. He's going to give it back. And when He does, He's going to grant us repentance. So we see a growing number of Jewish believers in the land from literally a handful in 1948 to maybe 20,000 today, something is happening. God is at work. We don't get our time frames wrong, but to me, it's so important to recognize God working in history and God's faithfulness. And if, and if you can keep the, the Jewish people, and look, there, there's all kinds of sentimentalizing of Israel that you get in Christian Zionist circles. And, yeah. and all of the Jews, and, yeah. you know, we tell them, we should really love the Jews. We say, how many do you know? Um, we, we said, tell you what, you got a burden for Israel, live in Tel Aviv for a year and see what happens to your burden. Uh, you know, there's the poem we joke about, oh, to live with the Jews in heaven, that will be glory. To live with them here on earth, that's another story. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to glorify the Jews. Uh, I, I, I grieve when I see Christian Zionists who don't preach the gospel to the Jewish yes, people right. and who don't say you're lost without Jesus. I, I stand heart to heart with you on this and the importance of the Great, uh, great Commission. But I, I just, I can't see why, maybe I'm missing something in your position, why you can't have the worldwide spiritual application and, and the meek inherit the earth, the expansion of Psalm 37 and Matthew 5 and, and 1 Corinthians 3, you inherit the whole world, the world is yours. Why you can't have all of that along with a particular people to whom God made promises, and uh, those promises still remain. Why I, can't both I, be true? They, I think both of them are true, but again, I, I, look, I, I'm, 
I really think that we have done a disservice to Jews with this, with the emphasis on the land, because we have, we're not preaching the gospel. Um, we take, we take, we take trips, I don't I have to take any trip to Israel, I guess I should one of these days, we take trips to Israel and we think we've done something for the Jewish people. Uh, I, again, I think the, the emphasis that, that I'm trying to get across here is that Israel being in the land isn't doing anything to them spiritually in the same way that the temple didn't do anything to them spiritually. People say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. I, 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 my, my point in all of this is when you look at the New Testament, the, the emphasis is, is constantly on, and I know you agree with this, and, and the person and work of Jesus Christ, which is transformational. It's transformational, it's transformational for me, it's transformational for you. Yes. I, th I, I believe that this, this 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 emphasis upon the land. Let's 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 ask the question. Okay, Israel is back in the land. Now I know your position is is that God is going to in fact um, create within within Israel a a, a new love and the love of Christ and the, and the proclamation of the gospel is going to bring blessings to the world. Well, actually, that is in fact the, the position of the reformers. You know. West, written into the Westminster Confession of Faith, most commentators on the Reformed people on the, on the book of um, on the book of Romans, that was their position, um, and, and I and I, I brought up this early on. I didn't hear you comment on this, and, and it is part of historic pre premillennialism as well. Is that with your position, or at least the, this, this popular position, two thirds? Here, God waits two thousand years. We're, we're looking two. Coming up on 2,000 years. Israel is back in the land. And two thirds of the Jews are slaughtered as part of God's working with the Jews. I, I don't see that as part of this blessing mm -hmm. to the Jews that you're talking about. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense to me. You either have to, I, I believe they said the Zechariah 13. Uh, passage really refers to the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And here's the difference. The difference is with leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, Jesus warned Israel for, for a generation for 40 years. He even told them when you see certain things take place, head to the hills. Mm -hmm. That's not happening today. What we're seeing today is literally Jews moving to Israel as part of some end time, end, end time perspective. And yet, according to what I've read, and I, you've heard me read these, two-thirds of, the, of the Jews are going to be slaughtered. Right, so it, the Zechariah 13 question, just like in Jeremiah 30, Jacob's trouble, uh, the application is, is a very fair question. Is, is it referring to something that happened in past history? Is it referring to the destruction of Jews in Jerusalem that Josephus puts it a million, you know, when that number was too high or not, it was dreadful, and then the Bar Kokhba revolt in 32, 135, uh, terrible, dreadful results again. Uh, is it somehow referring to a future event where two-thirds of European Jews die? I and mean, these things have happened. Most dispensationalists I know that speak of a terrible judgment coming uh, to the Jewish people in the future also think of the whole world being shaken. They'll go through Revelation and say three-quarters of the whole world is going to be shaken. So in other that words, makes you feel a lot better. Right, right, <laughs> that, that tribulation is coming everywhere. It's going to be disaster everywhere, including to Jews in Jerusalem. I would say that, that Zechariah 14 remains clearly future, and it does speak of half of the city of Jerusalem going into exile. But in my understanding of the end times, there's going to be a worldwide shaking at the end. There's going to be great calamity and hardship in the midst of which the gospel is going forth like never before. Uh, it's almost like God bears his arm and Satan bears his arm with the, with the final conflict and the triumph of the kingdom of God in the end. Uh, but I do say, I agree with you, that to say, come on, we've got to get all the Jews back to the land to bless them, why so they can be in one place to be destroyed, that's problematic. Yeah. It's definitely problematic, and many people haven't thought that through. But, but let, me, let me challenge this idea, though, that the restoration to the land has no spiritual significance. Again, the land itself is secondary, aside from the fact that the Jewish people do need a homeland, as, as we saw after the horrors of the Holocaust and the ongoing growth of anti-Semitism worldwide. 
So it is practical, pragmatic, okay, they still, they still need the vehicle, whether it's a Dodge, Dart, or a Porsche, they still need the vehicle, okay. So the bigger thing to me is God made promises and he keeps them. That's the bigger thing. That's why there's still dispute over Jerusalem, that's why there's hatred of the Jews, uh, because of God's promises, his integrity are at stake. So, what's happening? You go back to the beginning of the Zionist movement, which remember, was atheists, communists, that's why many of the, the rabbis opposed it, because it was so secular. Uh, so at that time, end of the 1900s, beginning of 2000, is, is a tremendous increase in world mission, tremendous increase in world harvest. When you have Jerusalem coming back into Jewish hands in, in, in 61 1967, that's also the beginning of what we call the Jesus People Movement, and, and a, a disproportionate number of Jews got saved. Almost everyone I know in Jewish ministry today got saved. In, in, in a short period of time, what was called the Jesus People Movement, which began the same year as, as um, Jerusalem coming back into Jewish hands, we see the continued exponential increase of the Great Commission, the gospel going to the nations around the world. I've, I've been in country after country after country and met uh, Christians in those obscure places, jungles of India, who want me to know since they were saved, God's laid it on their heart to pray for the Jewish people. And, and, to, and to pray during the feast times and to recognize God's purposes. I, I see these things unfolding. I, I see a recognition of, of a return to Jewish roots in many ways. Not, of course, you have that with the legalizing and Judaizing, which becomes erroneous and dangerous. But, but I see that. And, and lastly, when you look at the beginning of modern Israel, you could literally count on your hands the number of Messianic Jews in the country. Now there are several hundred Messianic congregations, some of them small house groups, but, but several hundred. Something is happening. Uh, see, the, the clean water is being sprinkled on their hearts. So I absolutely stand with you against the superficiality, against the sentimental Zionism. I have Christians come back from tours and they say, it was so wonderful to pray with the Jews at the wedding. Well, I said, do you weep for them? Do you weep and cry? Do you have a burden? Because ultimately we agree, you could die in Jerusalem, you can die in Moscow. If you die without Jesus, you're lost. Yeah. Uh, and you can See, die with a long beard or, or uh, where I'm a, a I'm a post-millennialist. And as a result, I do see that the Jews are going to come to Christ. Uh, since uh, Abraham is the heir of the world, Jews will not, it won't be just Israel that they'll have, but they'll be a part of this worldwide expansion of, of, the, of, the, of the church. Uh, could, could you just explain what post-millennialism is, just to make sure everybody knows uh, that. There are basically three millennial positions, pre-millennialism, pre all-millennialism, and post-millennialism. There are variations within those. We don't need to go all the details of that. And it's based upon Revelation chapter 20, thousand years. Uh, and supposedly that's when a lot of these things are supposed to take place. Although if you read Revelation chapter 20, there's, hard, there's not much in there about any of this. A premillennialist would say Jesus is going to return before the thousand years and then he will set up a physical kingdom on earth where he will reign from Jerusalem. So that's premillennialism. And with Israel like in the center. With of Israel at the center and you know some forms of some forms of premillennialism like dispensationalism would say that, that the temple has to be rebuilt and even animal sacrifices have to be reinstituted for atonement. Uh, that's that's dispensationalism. Pre historic, classical premillennialism is a little different. Uh, there's a progressive pre progressive dispensationalism. We don't have to go into all that. All you have to know is premillennialists believe that Jesus is going to reign, is going to come and then reign on the earth uh, for a thousand years. He comes before, before the thousand millennium. years. Premillennial. And all millennialists takes the thousand years of Revelation chapter twenty. Um, figuratively, God owns a cattle on a thousand year, on a thousand hills. Means God obviously God owns a cattle on all the hills. One day in the court of the Lord is, is uh, better than a thousand days somewhere else. The, the number thousand simply means a long period of time. The awe before millennial means there really isn't a millennium. There isn't this period in the future of great blessing. It shares, therefore, a lot of the end time scenarios of millennialists that we're going to have all hell's going to break loose. There's going to be a battle between the Antichrist and, and the, the people of God and so forth and so on. So the amillennialist doesn't believe in a millennium that is a golden age sometime in the future. Postmillennialist believes that Jesus returns 
after the thousand years. Post. So pre, post. The thousand years like the amillennialist, the postmillennialist believes that the thousand years represents a very long period of time. The postmillennialist believes that what will happen, that sometime, we don't know when, people will finally come to their senses in the power of the Holy Spirit and will recognize Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and you'll see a great advance of Christianity throughout the world, where you're going to see a preponderance of the population coming to Christ. Now, that may come through some great tribulation, uh, some, some, horrendous, some horrendous thing that takes place, and finally people wail and weep and get on their knees and finally turn to Christ, and after that, there'll be this period of blessing. That's the post-millennial view. As a post-millennialist, I believe that the Jews obviously are included in this, but so are the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus and everybody else. People are going to reject their unbelieving worldview and they will come, they will come to Christ. It's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Their falling will be obvious to all as, as, as the, 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 fall, the falling of Janus and Jambres who, who tried to oppose Moses. Uh, eventually, the op what we're seeing today, and I'm assuming Dr. Brown would, would agree, you're really seeing the end point of a humanistic secular worldview. Homosexuality and abortion are at the top of the list. What, what are the abortions doing? They're killing their future. They're killing their eschatology. What are the homosexuals doing? Well, they're, well, you know what they're doing. I don't have to tell you what they're doing. <laughs> and it, 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 it creates a, a, a sterile future. Yeah. As, they become, as they become more and more consistent with their unbelieving worldview, you see what happens. I'm going to, and I'll let Dr. Brown go after this, but I just want you to, uh, just to when you go to 2 second, second, uh, Timothy chapter 3, um, they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. Listen to the next verse. But they will not make further progress. For their falling will be obvious to all, as also that of those two came to be. Now, it doesn't stop there. And, and this is where, this is one of the reasons why I got involved in eschatology. Because as I went out and spoke on, 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 on the governmental issues, economic issues, and worldview issues, invariably there would be people in the church who would say, but we're living in the last days, why are we bothering with this? Jesus is coming back soon to rapture his church. And so I got involved in eschatology to try to answer some of these issues. Now, so the question comes, we don't know what the future is going to hold for us. We may get our heads kicked in quite a bit. And by the way, there are people around the world who are already going through a period of tribulation getting their heads kicked in. Pre-tribulation. Uh, yeah, pre-tribulation, exactly. They're, it's happening to them. Uh, there's no escape. There's no rapture that's going to take them out of this. So what do we do in between? This is where I believe the church has fallen down. And we're part of the problem. How is it that 2.5% of the population, if it's even that, of the homosexuals, can have advanced as fast and as broadly as they have when the church makes up possibly 30% of the population? Why are they in the courts and why are they, why are they in the educational establishment and the media? Where have the Christians been? Yeah. The reason, one of the reasons Christians haven't been involved is because they have adopted this sacred-secular dichotomy. We're only about sacred things over here. We don't want to get involved in the secular world. Well, now the secular world is going to take your sacred place away from you, and that's yeah. what you're going to do. So Paul, asks, Paul, Paul answers the question, so what do we do while we see this collapse of this, un, this unbelieving worldview take place? But you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, suffering such as happened to be at Antioch, at Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I, I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Why are we worried about these people? We've got the truth. They're the ones who are in deception, but we're not, being, we're not challenging them. If you ever read anything Michael, Michael Brown has written, write on the money for it. But he deals with Christians all the time, probably called on his radio show. They don't have a clue what's going on. I often turn the radio off when it's an interview show when some Christian calls in. 
They don't have any idea what they're talking about. You, however, talking to Timothy, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now here's a passage ripped out of his, his, his contextual basis. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching and reproof for correction for training in righteousness that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. See, while this disintegration is taking place, we don't look for the rapture. As this disintegration takes place, we see the end point of unbelieving worldview. We're still going to go through persecutions and then sufferings and so forth. Yeah. We have a job to do, and unfortunately, the church, I think the church is going to learn it the hard way. Uh, may, may I insert one question? Because some of us may have missed it in the digression there. Uh, Dr. Brown, you mentioned, I asked you the question for the sake of the people about when were the Jews scattered? It's two-pronged, Gary, for you to help clarify. Number one, do you believe what he said about the scattering? Is that literally historically true that the Jews would, were scattered? The second part of that would be, why not then is his question, why isn't that legitimate for you to answer about? And if that is a true statement that they were biblically and historically scattered, why wouldn't there be the other side of that that, that would be historically and biblically regained? Okay, here's, here's, here's my perspective on this. God is a promise-keeping God. But it seems for 2,000 years, He hasn't been keeping His promises if you, follow, if you follow that particular position. Because it seems like every time the Jews do something, they're scattered. My point is that if you read, if you read the Gospel accounts, and if you read the, the Book of Acts, and you read the New Testament, God was keeping His promises to Israel in exacting detail. He was bringing them together in Christ because Jesus is the focus of history, not Israel. Israel was the vehicle by which the promised Messiah was supposed to come. That's why Matthew and Luke have those genealogies in there. They had to make the case of this promised Messiah who he was. He had to come, those prophecies had to be fulfilled in terms of where he was. But what's what I think is, is, is what's happening in the New Testament era here is, is that since Jesus is the focus of all this, the gathering was taking, was taking place in their day. They were being gathered as one new man in Christ. If you, go, if you look at Ephesians, Ephesians, chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, and it includes the, it includes the nations in this as well, and I, I won't read all of this, but it says in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. This again shows that in Christ, Jew and Gentile, there is no distinction here. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, uh, by having put to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. <laughs> Old Testament passage. And through him we both have our access to one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, mm -hmm. having built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. All right, so, so that underscores everything that I've said, that the spiritual promises are spiritually fulfilled, and the physical promises must be physically fulfilled. Let's remember 2 Corinthians 1, in Jesus, all the promises are yes and amen. Let's remember Acts 3, that everything the prophets spoke of would happen. They indisputably, over and over, if you want, I mean, we don't have time. If we had two hours, I don't know that I could read all of the passages that speak of a literal physical regathering, a literal glory of God in the land, uh, uh, literal things happen that would affect the entire world. Uh, Isaiah 62, for example. We are to pray for Jerusalem, a physical city. It's not a spiritual application there. 
until it is the praise of all the earth. Why? Because Jerusalem is better or worse? No, because God's promises will be fulfilled there. What I find ironic, because you know I'm with you step for step in terms of the relevance of the gospel to culture, and I'm in that battle day and night. My newest book coming out in September is called Outlasting the Gay Revolution, where homosexual activism is really going and how to turn the tide. So I'm completely with you in terms of we must be a relevant voice in the culture, and I've said for many, many years that we opted out, we're out of here any moment, and those who said we're here long term, they've rewritten the laws, that, in their zeal and their passion, they've re re rewritten the laws, and, and, and I pointed out that, that gay activists have been much more effective than Christians because they don't go to a gay meeting once a week, that's who they are, they're gay. Uh, yeah. We go to a Christian meeting once a week, think we're going to change the world. We get together, sing and clap, think we're going to change the world. That's not how you start a revolution. Yeah. It's by, not by going to church, but by being the church, the yeah. ecclesia. Yeah. But, but what I find ironic, and I know it's the last thing in your intent, is that you're act actually guilty of the sacred secular distinction when it comes to Israel. Because I'm saying there are literal promises that were literally made that have to be literally fulfilled. And you say, no, they're all spiritually fulfilled. So once again, what you come down to is... God telling the Jewish people, I will scatter you in my anger. How did he do it? Literally, physically. And I'll regather you in my love. What does that mean? One new man in Jesus. That, that's not what he was talking about there. Throughout history, and I focused on this in my doctoral dissertation, the, the meaning of the Hebrew word rafa, uh, to, to, to restore, heal, make whole, that a principle you can find is that the healing must be just as literal as the smiting. So if God in judgment says, I'm going to smite you with boils and blindness and sickness, and then he says, but I'm going to heal you. And, and then one generation later, he says, I'm going to save your soul, but you still have boils and blindness and, and other afflictions. Then he didn't really do any problems. The Jews, here's, the, here's, the, here's the point. Jesus did, in fact, heal them. They, thousands, maybe, maybe, who knows, a million Jews came to Christ during this first century. They were, in fact, healed. They were, they, they, they experienced the, the, the grace. The were grace they physically God. regathered as promised? But you mentioned healing. I'm just talking about. No, I, was, I was using an analogy there. But, but, I, but that, 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 wasn't the, that wasn't the primary issue. That so, is that being brought back into the land doesn't heal them. But, but, but fine, it, fine. But God said once you're back in the land. Remember, this is simply a physical, tangible way. And you're, you're so rightly emphasizing God's physical acts in this world that we don't spiritualize everything. It is a physical sign of the integrity of God. Here, let, let, let's, maybe we can fine tune this question. You said that you do believe in a future salvation of the Jewish people because you believe in a future salvation of the whole world. Okay. Uh, it could be that the nation of Ecuador ceases to exist and the, the Ecuadorian people, as a people, cease to exist and, and yet post-millennial view can still come to pass, yes? There can still be a harvest of the nations, and people who live in Ecuador will be part of the ecclesia, right? Uh, it could be that the people who were once called Philistines don't exist anymore. They're extinct, and yet your post-millennial view can still hold true, right? There's still a harvest of the nations, the gospel triumphs, the world is filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord, right? Through the preaching of the gospel. Could the nation of Israel, or could the Physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those that we would identify as, as Jews today, could they cease to exist as a people and the Bible be true and your post-millennial view be true? That to me is the crux. Let's, let's even put the land aside, although I believe my points about the land stand strong. But what about the, because the, the, that's my biggest issue. Are there promises that remain that God will keep us as a people and that there'll be an end time turning? Uh, because we all agree anybody can be saved and everyone must come through Jesus to be saved. We agree on that. Uh, there's no favoritism, there's no other way, there's no second covenant. But uh, the nation of America, for all intents, could cease to exist as a nation and the post millennial interview still be true. Right, right. Okay, the way we're going. Uh, but could the descendants of Israel, those physical descendants, not the ecclesia of all believers, cease to exist and, and the promises still be true, God keeps his word, and your, your eschatology uh, held together. That's a big one. Well, again, we're, we're talking land, and we're talking people, we're two different things. Well, just, just talk people, people right now. Just talk people. Well, I don't like hypotheticals at all, man. But that's not hypothetical. I would say, hey, I'm a Jew. I'm not hypothetical. Let me ask you this. What, what tribe are you from? Uh, presumably Judah. 
But we make up, Jacob addresses us as the 12 tribes, so we, we are a remnant of the 12 tribes, and there are probably others scattered around the world that only God knows that make up the 12 tribes. I would say it would be absolutely impossible to eradicate Jews from the world. It's, it's, it's an impossibility. It's just, it's impossible to do so. So to ask a question like, and I understand what the question brings, but it would be impossible. How would you tell? Who, who, who do you tell is a Jew today? Well, God knows. Well, of course he does. Uh, all right, so, so does he, did he, are there promises that remain to that distinct people that though I scatter you around the world, I will never totally destroy you. I, I will preserve you as a people, as an ethnos. I will preserve you as such. So he knows who they are. Is God actively keeping us? Because he didn't make that promise to Mexico. He didn't make that promise right. to America. He didn't make that that's promise. A, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good legitimate question. Um, as post-millennialist, I would say, since the Jews are part of God's promised promise plan, then I would say it, it, it can't happen. It, it, it's impossible for it to happen, sure. Okay, yeah. so we agree on that. Yeah. All right, that's that's big. That's that's very important. All right. I mean, we see, agree on a ton of other things, but in the context of today, something. Here. That, that's big. This is this has always been part of my theological heritage long before the dispensations came around and yes, set sir. Israel aside as a yeah. So I mean, that's that's certainly nothing new. And I I pointed this out to people when when John MacArthur you know, did his thing about about Israel, and he knew better than this because he had. Um, Ian Murray come to yes. speak, and Ian Murray had written Puritan Hope. Exactly. In fact, the Puritan Hope is part of the Puritan Hope was the fact that the Jews would embrace Jesus as as as, 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 as the Savior. Savior. Yeah. So yes. Well, <laughs> who? What's, okay, John Owen. John Owen. Exactly. The Jews yes. shall be. And by the way, this book, Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, is the most relevant book that I've written on the subject at, at hand tonight. Um, <laughs> And of course, we have it at the book table, and it just now. So it's just full price. I have one but, um, question about your book. Yeah. Why didn't you deal with the dispensational view on Zechariah 13, 8, and 9 in that book? Um, it wasn't my focus in writing it, honestly, uh, was number one uh, to bring to the, uh, the church the pain of the Jewish people and the suffering through history and God's eternal promises. So that was the, that's the burden out of which I grew up. Back in World War II, it was part of the distance. Oh, I, I understand that, and it's, it's, it is something that I've addressed in other contexts. Also, at that time, uh, my strong focus was not to divide over these issues. For example, I, I'd throw myself in with you side by side in so many issues, and we could, we could divide over this till the, till the day we die or the Lord returns or whoever's eschatology is right. Uh, and we'd stand by, side by side as brothers and, I, and, and you know, without contradiction. So, I was very careful uh, to not divide over dispensational issues. I worked, I, I preached for people for years with dispensations, probably still do. Uh, but it is something I've addressed. And when I preached in Israel, uh, after this book came out at a major conference, I raised those very points for, within the year. But uh, so I, I have one short chapter in the book with some of these amazing quotes from Christian leaders and Pastor John Owen, who was the, the theologian of the Puritan theologians in the 1600s, said, uh, the Jews shall be gathered from all parts of the earth where they are scattered and brought home into their homeland. Now, surely he didn't believe in it the way it's happened now. He believed in, as they come to faith, there will be a miraculous return. But he did believe that there were promises that remained to a distinct people, and that included the restoration to the land and to faith, which that's my big point. A lot of Puritans did. Right. right. Uh, Owen said there's not any promise anywhere of raising up a kingdom unto the Lord Jesus Christ in this world, but it is either expressed or clearly intimated that the beginning of it must be with the Jews. Uh, Robert Layton, the contemporary of Owen, they forget a main point for the church's glory who pray not daily for the conversion of the Jews. Undoubtedly, that people of the Jews shall once more be commanded to arise and shine, and their return shall be the riches of the Gentiles, Romans 11, 12, and that shall be a more glorious time than ever the church of God did yet behold. So they believed that, that there was a specific calling on the church, like Robert Murray McShane in the 1800s called Holder McShane because of his godly living, that, that revival broke out at his home congregation when he was on a mission to what was then Palestine. And, and they felt that bringing the gospel to the Jews first was, was a sacred calling, that Romans 1.16 was still operative to the Jew first, uh, meant a, a priority, and that because they wanted to bring salvation uh, to Israel, that God poured out revival on their church uh, and, and that a 
key to, to revival around the whole world was the salvation of Israel. So uh, if, if you and I differed on the land, that would be very secondary to me than differing over the fact that God's promises remain to a distinct people, that he's preserved, that's the only reason we're still here, he preserved us, okay? And that the church does have a mission to bring the gospel to the Jewish people and to provoke Israel to jealousy and that somehow Jewish people turn into the Lord is of end time significance. If we can agree on that and differ on the land, then the land part would be very secondary. And that's, I mean, that is a position that, I mean, we've held for, you know, well, for me for decades. I mean, it's been a, been right. a better position for sure. <laughs> Could I ask one, as we, as we begin to wind down, I asked Dr. DeMar a question now for you, Dr. Brown. The, the ambiguity sometimes within the church we talk about the future gathering and the, the riches and the awakening like life from the dead in a future. Here's the problem with the sentimentalism of Christians toward Israel and Jews. It's rarely addressed that, okay, let's say that, uh, and this is a question, that God's brought Israel back and he's already begun that this is his work. What is the benefit for the unregenerate Jew who rejects the gospel. Because the church tends to, and the dispensationalists would say, oh, they're God's elect, they're God's chosen. But I hear you saying, apart from the gospel, they will perish in eternity. Yes. What would be the redemptive benefit of being in a land and yet reject the gospel? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. And it's really, really important to grab hold of this. In terms of an individual Jew being born in Jerusalem, today does not make them any closer to God, any closer to salvation uh, than being born in Moscow 100 years ago, okay? I want to be very clear on that. But there's something tremendously significant. And, and please, whatever your position on these issues is, please hear me carefully. Contemporary Christian love for Israel, as much as I'm not a dispensationalist, contemporary Christian love for Israel Solidarity with the Jewish people in the midst of their suffering. That does not make us anti-Palestinian. It does not mean we sanction everything Israel does. Benjamin Netanyahu is not the savior of the world. Let me be clear. But Christian love for Israel and, and prayer for Israel has gone a long way to undoing the horrible history of anti-Semitism among professional Christians. And, and that when the Israelis see that Christians do love them and pray for them, and even when they continue in unbelief that they love them and pray for them, that it's not some kind of setup, and if they don't perform prophetically, they're gonna turn. It's been enough decades that, that it has gone a long way to undo the horrors of anti-Semitism perpetrated in Jesus' name. What's that got to do with them coming back to the land? It's part of the recognition that God is at work. It is a way that God used to alert the church worldwide to pray for the salvation of Israel. And the horrors of the Holocaust and the shame of the professing church in that day has now provoked Christians in love. So God has used these things to provoke Christian love for Israel and prayer for Israel. And therefore, while a Jewish person born in Israel is just as lost as a Jewish person born in New York City or in Paris, France, and while they still need Jesus, God's dealing with Israel in a tangible and distinct way has brought this to the attention of the church worldwide, which is engaged in more active prayer for Israel, more prayer for the Messiah's return, and, and more understanding of the, the horrors of church history. So God, in a broader way, has definitely used this. And, and when Christians now begin to discount uh, God's dealing with modern Israel, begin to, to push that away, what I often see is tragic. And in no way, I don't want anyone to think by any implication, I'm, I'm accusing Dr. Duar of this, I'm categorically not, categorically not. But I constantly see Christians today, Palestinian Christians, others who side with them, who reject God's purposes for Israel going back to the land, they end up with, a, with an, an anti-Semitic attitude. They end up with, with some of the same hateful ideas and attitudes. They end up with something that drives Jews away from the gospel. So this physical dealing with a physical people in a physical land once again brings to surface attitudes towards God, attitudes towards the gospel in many ways. And therefore I see all of this as part of our God's redemptive plan. Let me reiterate again. Under no circumstances could anyone dare say 
and I'm implying that there is a shred of anti-Semitism in Dr. DeMar, or that he is somehow anti-Israel or anti-Jewish or contributing to that. Not a sentence, not a syllable. If you say that, you are misquoting and misrepresenting me, all right? But I have seen the implications of this in so many other circles, and you'll normally see those who hold to the most virulent anti-Israel theology today are those who say there is no significance in the keeping of the Jewish people or the return of the Jewish people to the land. And that's why there is a redemptive side. Let me add one thing. This is, uh, I, I don't want to harp on this two-thirds of the Jews thing, but it, it, it's, gotten, it's gotten outside our circles into Jewish circles. Um, I don't know if you recall the 2012 Democratic National Convention. Uh, there was a Jewish man who was interviewed on the floor of the convention. Uh, it was in Florida's Palm Beach County Democratic Party. And this is what he said. The, the Christians just want us to be there so we can be slaughtered and converted and bring on the second coming of Jesus Christ. The worst possible allies for the Jewish state are the fundamentalist Christians who want Jews to die and convert so they can bring on the second coming of their Lord. It is a false friendship. They are seeking their own ends and not ours. I don't believe the fundamentalists urging a greater Israel are friends of the Jewish state. Um, my, my point in bringing this up is this, this two-thirds of Israel being slaughtered has not been dealt with. And maybe you're the guy to deal yeah. with it. Uh, because they don't listen to me. I, you know, uh, and, you know, why would they? You can uh, make you an honorary rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a picture of myself. I, I actually looked like looked like a rabbi. <laughs> I, I had the hair for it and everything. Uh, the, 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 the thing of it is, um, the answer isn't well. This is Tommy Ice's answer, and you, you kind of said it joking. Well, yeah, two thirds of them are going to be killed, but what is it? Nine tenths of the yeah, man, jump well, the whole world has to be destroyed. I don't, I don't think that's I don't think that's that's a, a good answer. That that needs to be dealt with. That's why when I read your book, I said I'm wondering why he doesn't deal with it. I know you, you knew about it. Uh, this this has to be dealt with because when something when something happens to the Jews that is a negative thing, some some tragedy takes place, and this took place during World War II. If you read Dwight Wilson's book, Armageddon Now, there were Christians who said this was prophesied. This was what was supposed, this is what's supposed to take, take place. And Wilson says, he says they, they took a hands-off perspective. And so when they read, read stories about the persecution of, of Jews, they said this was, this was predicted. And because, and because we live in a parenthesis, and that God isn't dealing with Israel now, God is dealing with the church. He won't deal with Israel again until the uh, until the rapture takes place. Uh, and Tommy Ison said said this that the, he's Tommy I said that the church has superseded Israel. He's a dispensationalist. See, my my involvement in this is to get out of this church Israel distinction idea. That's why I put so much emphasis on what the New Testament says about. The, the first Christians, first ecclesia, where Jews and, and Gentiles were grafted in. If you post, if you postpone these promises, then what happens in between? Every time something happens to Israel, seemingly it's God's judgment upon Israel as a people and as a nation. And I think that is uh, problematic and troublesome for Jews. Because if something happens to Israel and God isn't now blessing them, and He's not going to do this in the future, they deserve it. They just look, they're they're Christ rejectors. They just they they deserve it. And here's evidence here, this date, this date, this date, this date. My my whole philosophy on all this is we have got to jump this gap idea, postponement of ideas. If you want to, there needs to be a better explanation for it than I guess what I'm hearing. Uh, these days. Now, this is something that's going to take place yet in the future. Wait, when? It's not going to take place prior to the, the rapture of any sort. It's not going to take place during the Great Tribulation because two thirds of the Jews are going to be slaughtered. Revelation chapter 20, if you read Revelation chapter 20 and try to fit all those passages that you could read, and, uh, they're not mentioned in there. 
When does this take place? It doesn't take, does it take place in the new heavens and, and the new earth, uh, which is, which if you believe in a literal 1,000 years, can't be for another 1,000 years. So there, there's more to this dynamic than the kinds of things that we and I just have discussed tonight. And, and I think uh, an important thought to take away from this is, okay, so what do I do with this? What's it got to do with me? Now remember, Israelis, Jews are pretty pragmatic and pretty skeptical. So the fact that they recognize the genuineness of Christian love and the sacrificial nature of Christian love, uh, and they, they realize it's not just an end time setup. And there are plenty that just look at it as an end time setup, hence the Jewish man's comments. I remember in grad school, my professor, main professor, saying it's kind of a backhanded compliment. Because if we don't perform the way you want us to and all come to Christ, you know, the second coming doesn't happen. What happens when we don't perform? And Martin Luther started with great love for the Jewish people and sensitivity in 1523. And by 1543, it was one of the most terrific things ever been written by, by any professing Christian that were utilized literally by, by Adolf Hitler and, and Kristallnacht in November 9th and 10th of 1938. So uh, the question is, okay, what do I do with this? How, how do I work these things out? That's why I do believe it is important to see that God has given actual promises to Jewish people. That's why we have had such a supernatural history. That's why there has been such widespread irrational hatred against us. I've done outreach lectures at Yale and Columbia University, right? I, I call it the irrational or paranormal in the X day, uh, X, uh, X files days, but the paranormal nature of anti-Semitism, and did a college lecture, university lecture, that the only rational explanation for worldwide anti-Semitism in history is the devil is behind it. That was my explanation, which then tied in with all of the spiritual promises of the return of Jesus. So if we understand what this means to me is that, that I need to contend for the Jewish people in prayer because they remain yet with a purpose. I need to have a broken heart as Paul did because the vast majority remain outside of, of the salvific blessings. I need to pray because their salvation will be life from the dead. And I need to recognize that there's a supernatural attack against them. I, I think if we have that heart, that we can be like the Corey Ten Booms in, in World War II that demonstrated genuine Christian love and who have street names in Israel and are honored as the righteous Gentiles, uh, we can be as those who I've prayed with around the world who weep for the salvation of Israel, but I find them also praying for the restoration of the Jewish people to the land, seeing that restoration to the land is part of God's tangible working with the tangible people that he'll bring to himself. And honestly, as far as the Zechariah 13 passage, uh, I, I am not dogmatic. I have not exegeted it uh, in a way that's satisfactory to me. Just like when I did my Jeremiah commentary, I was forced to deal with passages in a certain depth and level. I, I see the validity of, of a first century interpretation, but I'm not convinced of its validity. I see the potential of different layers historically. If there is a future fulfillment yet, then it's in the, in the midst of the worst calamity worldwide we've ever experienced, and Israel could be the safest place of all, which, which is no joke. But I, I absolutely take your exhortation to wrestle it through, and to be, because on a certain level, I'm in controversy day and night. I don't look for more controversy, but if it's there to take on, I absolutely recognize the validity of the question, the seriousness of the quotes you pose, and, and pray with me that, that God would give me a good voice to really address these things in a holistic way. But if we could recognize the promises remain to a distinct people, God knows who they are, we should be praying for that people, bringing the gospel to them, and believing that their salvation will be life from the dead. And I posit as well, and this part Dr. DeMar would not agree with me on, that the physical restoration and return to the land is part of that outward physical demonstration of God's covenant keeping, which then urges us to pray all the more. If you can take that away, then that would be of high significance. And then challenge with all the different points we've made, both quoting scripture, examine your eschatology, your views based on that, and take it to the Lord for further insight. Those are, are those my closing comments? And maybe Dr. DeMars, does that, does that work? work. You, you can take a few moments. I don't know if what you just said was your concluding remarks. But well, I can my, like it. My, <laughs> good word for me. My, my, again, my, my deal is uh, I, I don't think we give I don't think we give enough uh, validity to what, in fact, took place in the first century. I would like to get this idea of church-Israel distinction. I think that needs to be wiped off the table. As, as I think, as I've demonstrated, that isn't that isn't the case. Um, there was no church-Israel distinction in, in, in the New Testament. Uh, the first church was, in fact, 
made up of Jews and Gentiles, where the nations were, were grafted into an existing Jewish uh, Jewish body of believer, an assembly or congregation of believers. Uh, and being, I, I do believe, in, in fact, that there will that well, Christians today, uh, Jews today, Israelites today, are embracing Jesus, you know, pre, uh, embracing Jesus as a promised Messiah. That really is the only hope hope of the world. Uh, for, for Israel and for Palestinians and for Muslims and so forth. And I, I don't, I'm not really sure the church really believes that. Like, that's, that's an issue. I don't know if they really do in fact believe it. One last point I think needs to be made is uh, if you criticize something Israel does, the retort often is if you bless Israel, Israel will if you bless Israel, God will bless you. If you curse Israel, God will curse you. So you can't even be morally or ethically critical of what takes place among Israel, like or something like this. As soon as you say something like that, you would believe in, you believe in replacement theology, supersessionism, and you're cursing Israel. Um, that's, that's hardly a possible thing since God sent Israel. Both, both kingdoms off into exile as a result of their sins. And we could take a lesson from that. And I think that's what we find in the first two, uh, chapters two and three of the book of Revelation. Written to seven churches, essentially saying, I believe the book of Revelation is, is, is about events leading up to and, and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which also parallels with Romans chapter 11. You better follow the existence I understand the example of what happened to Israel with this coming judgment because the same thing can happen to you. Your candlestick can be removed. Judgment can come upon you. And that's a message to the church today, just like it was a message to Israel back, back then. We've got a lot of work to do, but at the same time to say, we aren't getting out of here in a rapture. And we have got to make very important and critical, hard decisions as to what we're going to do in the midst of this rise of evil in this world. Amen. One final question. I'm going to cheat. John Hankey has advanced the notion that Christians should not wish to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. True or false? He told me face to face that he does not espouse dual covenant theology that if there were rabbis and others in a Sunday service, that he would preach Jesus to them like anyone else. And his right-hand man, a Jewish man, David Brog, told me over the phone that John Hagee frequently tells him he needs Jesus. Uh, those are statements that were made directly to me. Uh, he also told me that he's very careful because of his ties with Jewish people to make it clear that he's not there to evangelize uh, that the purpose of his uh, Christians United for Israel is not to evangelize because there's a lot of Jewish sensitivity about that. Uh, Jews were forced to have debates with, with Christians. Uh, Catholic leaders would come into a synagogue and force them to hear a conversionary message. Uh, all of their religious literature was burned. Their Talmuds were burned after these forced debates. Uh, so there's sensitivity there. You have to demonstrate that you are simply there as a friend and not to evangelize. In other words, if I say we're going to have a pro-Israel meeting and I bring all these Jews into the building and I do it and say, oh, let me tell you about Jesus and why you're all lost without him, that would be duplicitous and that would be what Jews have seen through the centuries. So I understand the balance and I, and I do believe you can be a friend of Israel by saying, hey, we want you to believe in Jesus. We're Christians. We believe you need to, but we're your friend anyway. Uh, you could argue that other statements he has made or things he has written uh, belie that. And, and, and give way to the dual covenant idea and the idea that, that Christians should not be evangelizing Jews. I can only say when I asked him face to face in the presence of other witnesses, he said he does not believe in dual covenant, Jews need Jesus to be saved, uh, and that he would preach the same to everyone except in his pro-Israel stance, he's not there to evangelize. But again, I haven't read everything. If you've read other things and seen overt statements to the contrary, um, I could be wrong. I'm simply, I do my best to believe what someone tells me, and that's what he told me. Oh, I, I just disagree with him on the whole blood moon thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing I really studied about John Hay. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very edifying, very profitable time together from two dear brothers who have demonstrated 
a real Christian virtue of graciousness and kindness to each other on a subject that can be controversial and potentially bring conflict. I would submit to you, they warrant our giving honor to whom honor is due. Would you join me to tell me how much you appreciate them being on the platform together? And now, this would not be a kingdom gathering if we let you go at this point. We would like to take a moment, Pastor Jim, come. We would never want to uh, refuse to invest in their expense, their time, their energies, and their effort, and their sacrifice from their families and their ministries to be with us. So we would like to give you an opportunity to bless both of these speakers tonight. They warrant that. And so we would like to ask you, Pastor Jim, come and you exhort us what you'd like. Yes, amen. You can be seated if you would, please. Once again, my brothers, we are overwhelmed by the grace that God has shown us tonight uh, through this ministry. You know, I, I heard uh, Rafi Zacharias tell the story one time, I think I told it here recently, of a lady in, on an airplane, she was sitting next to a preacher. She re recognized the guy was a preacher and uh, things got real shaky and turbulent and it seemed like the plane was going down and she